Hey everybody, in this episode of Trek in Time, we explore the first steps to building the Federation, and should we really be surprised that there was pain in birthing it? Welcome to Trek in Time, everybody, where we're looking at every episode of Star Trek in chronological order. That means we're back in Enterprise, the oldest stories in the Trek universe. We also take a look at how things were at the time of the original broadcast in our world. So we're looking at things from 2003. Interesting times abound. So who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a published author. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. And he's also a gigantic Trek nerd. How are you doing, nerd? nerd? <laughs> this nerd is good. How about you? I'm doing okay. <laughs> it's been a whirlwind of a weekend for me, so still trying to catch my breath, but I think I'll be okay. Before we get into this episode, we're going to be talking about Cease Fire. Matt, I believe you have some comments from our previous episodes. Yes, we do. There's a few I wanted to bring up from the episode Dawn, which is the one where Trip is stranded on the planet with that other alien. <laughs> one from Martin Charles Pitt Bradley. First and solid enemy mine reference, but I also had submit Jordy's episode The Enemy from Next Generation. Mm -hmm. I completely forgot about that episode. It's exactly along the same lines as this. He's stranded on a planet with, I think it's a Romulan, and the yeah. two of them have to work together to get off the planet. So it's the exact same basic premise. And it's, I think that one's actually probably done better than this one personally, mm. but it's not by much. I think these were both solid episodes. The other comments, there was kind of a thread started by Robotrav. You guys should totally do a podcast special and do Enemy Mine. I love that movie. And I'm sure Sean could probably rewrite the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that followed up by AJ Chan, who said, or Starship Troopers. And what mm. I found funny about both of those comments was I grew up watching Enemy Mine on HBO. It was like shown like it felt like every other day and I watched yeah. it like every time it was on. I, I, I yeah. love that movie and it's bad. It's a bad movie. I absolutely yeah, it's love. not. It's not a great movie, but it's a yeah. fun movie. Yeah. And then Starship Troopers. I remember seeing that in a the theater and being so angry and hating it. And then like a decade later, I started watching it on video and then on TV. And now that's one of my favorite movies. It's like I, yeah. I don't think I appreciated it for what it was at the time, which is yeah, actually we a really good movie. Yeah, we haven't we won't go too deep into a Starship Troopers uh, <laughs> commentary right now, but I will say this. It is smarter than people give it credit for. Way smarter. It was knowingly it was knowingly designed to be an examination of the rise of fascism. So Yep. Yep. Very, very smart movie. Yep. But as for today's episode, as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about cease fire. And guess what, everybody? That bell you hear means one thing. That's right. It's time for Matt to read the Wikipedia description. Matt, jump in. <laughs> okay. Ceasefire is the 41st episode, <laughs> production 215 on the television series Star Trek Enterprise, the 15th of the second season. I like that we were now in a, whoever wrote the previous episode clearly wrote this one. Mm -hmm. The show is set in the 22nd century of the Star Trek universe with, <laughs> with premise being <laughs> Earth's faster than light spaceship. Enterprise explores the galaxy under command of Captain Archer. This has nothing to do with the episode. Captain Archer attempts to negotiate a ceasefire between the Andorians and the Vulcans. Okay, before you say anything, all they needed was that last sentence. <laughs> the rest of that could be thrown out. Yeah. Somebody needs to go yeah. in in Wikipedia and just delete all of that except for that one sentence. Yeah, and what I like about this is... <laughs> Again, in Matt's reading, you can't hear the the breaks in the the setup, but that last sentence is actually its own paragraph. Yes. So this is clearly somebody was standing there rattling on about Earth's faster than light spaceship. Enterprise explores the galaxy, capital G galaxy, under the command of Captain Archer. And then somebody else walked into the room and just went, hey, listen, Captain Archer negotiates a ceasefire. That's what's going on here. Yeah. You can almost hear the frustration in the last line. So. <laughs> It's like a passive aggressive description. <laughs> yeah. It might as well be in parentheses. Yeah. So this episode was directed by David Strayton. We've seen his work before. He most recently worked on Vanishing Point, And this one was written by Chris Black, who's given credit on Singularity. And this episode, when did we first see it? February 12th, 2003. So Matt, I'm sure I don't have to remind you. 
you were rocking out to I'm With You by Avril Lavigne. That's right. It was the third single off of her debut album. And at the movie theater, well, I think we all remember where we were when How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days dropped. And oh, it yeah. earned $23 million at the box office. And this, of course, is a romantic comedy directed by Donald Petrie, starring Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey. And what can we say about this movie other than this continues to be probably the worst movie I have ever paid money to see in a theater? Really? Yes. <laughs> you want to talk about walking out of a theater angry? Uh-huh. I walked out of the theater angry. Nothing against romantic comedies. A good romantic comedy is great. But notice I said a good romantic comedy. Yeah, this is not a good romantic comedy. I've never seen it. Well, I think it's available everywhere. I think it's being broadcast on Pluto and HBO and every other place you can imagine right now. So please <laughs> brew a pot of tea and sit down and have a great time. So this episode airing on February 12th, 2003, had 4.7 million viewers. This is a little bit up from previous weeks. However, Enterprise at this point still continues to struggle in the ratings against the other competition in primetime. My wife and kids had 12 million viewers. The Price is Right Million Dollar Spectacular had 11. That 70s show, 12 million. Ed had 9 million. And Ed is one of those programs that, oh yeah, that was a program. Yeah. I remember. I remember seeing commercials for that. But Enterprise is still able to kick Dawson's Creek. However, not by much. By barely 400,000 viewers, apparently. The most watched program this week, CSI was back on top. And in the news, well, just like last week's episode where I talked about how the episode in the parable around to Paul dealing with a syndrome that would potentially kill her, the metaphor being for AIDS, the idea that it was a story that felt pulled directly from the context of the world that it was made in. This episode feels the same way to me. In the New York Times, one of the major headlines was top U.S. officials were beginning to link Iraq to Al-Qaeda. And of course, this is part of linking the September 11th attacks to Iraq to prepare the U.S. with a mindset ready to go to war. However, long term, looking back, the consensus of intelligence experts has been that these contexts between Iraq and Al-Qaeda never led to an operational relationship, and that consensus is backed up by reports from the Independent 9-11 Commission and by declassified Defense Department reports, as well as by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, whose 2006 report of Phase 2 of its investigation into pre-war intelligence reports concluded that there was no evidence of ties between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Critics of the Bush administration have said Bush was intentionally building a case for war with Iraq without regard to factual evidence. On April 29, 2007, former Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet said on 60 Minutes, quote, we could never verify that there was any Iraqi authority, direction, and control complicitly with Al-Qaeda for 9-11 or any operational act against America, period. So having said all of that, we turn now to the episode ceasefire. And Matt, I think you'll probably agree with me in saying, yeah, this episode feels very much like it was made in the era where those things were oh, in yeah. the news. Yeah, no, it's very much of its time because it's, it's tying into everything that's going on in the Middle East at that time. So it's like there's definitely a through line that comes through crystal clear for me. Even to the setup of what is being fought over in yep. this episode, the episode revolves around the Andorians and the Vulcans are in battle over a small planet and it is on the frontier it's described as being on the frontier between the two systems the vulcan system and the andorian system the andorians call it Waitan, the vulcans call it pan makar both sides claim it however before they started fighting over it nobody really wanted it it was described as an uninhabitable class d planet and the andorians moved in terraformed it making it inhabitable and then the Vulcans showed up and said, no, no, this belongs to us. And that setup of the conflict was supposed to be 100 years before this story. So for 100 years now, there's been battling over what was previously undesirable territory as a metaphor for the tension in the Middle East, the arguments about who owns what land in the Middle East. This seems like 
it's just literally lifting that yes. context and putting it into space. Of and tensions have always been high between these two people. And it's all boiling down to one small location where it's that's going to be the flashpoint. And I don't know if this hit you, but with what's going on in the world right now with Ukraine and Russia, I was getting hit in the face with the Vulcans annexed this planet because they thought that the Andorians were getting a little too close for comfort. And that's exactly what Putin did to Crimea and the yeah. lower regions of the Ukraine. And that's the rationale he used. And I'm sitting there watching this episode going, whoa, this episode had a lot of weight for the day it was made. And it feels like it, they could have made it today because like, yeah. it is in the news again. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's still very timely. Yeah. And that, I think, gets to the heart of what this felt like for me. You touching on it was timely for the day. It's timely now. That is Star Trek, I think, in a nutshell. In, By at, at extracting its at, at its, its best. best when Star yep. Trek extracts moments of the era and tells a story cloaked in sci-fi technobabble and gets to some nuggets of hard truth in that storytelling it resonates again and again and again the original series has that Th this series has that and for me as i was watching this i kept thinking this is the most roddenberry-esque of the episodes that we've seen in a mm -hmm. while yeah. it really felt like this was the essence of trek taking a hard look at two sides both of whom have reasons to distrust the other one the vulcans decision to annex this planet is built entirely around a logical conclusion. There's only one reason why the Andorians would be there. I thought it was very interesting. Nobody bothered to ask any of the Andorian characters. Were you doing that? <laughs> why are you here? Yeah. Nobody bothers to say, why is you here? What is the value of this planet to you? Everybody who is laying claim to this is laying claim simply to lay claim. It, there is no, right. oh, we found a resource. Oh, there's a value th valuable thing here. There's no attempts at that kind of explanation. It is literally, we want it. And if we want it, you're going to want to try and take it from us. And so the episode revolves, I was just going to say very quickly, wh what were you going to say? I'll I was going to take a step back. It's, you may have been about to touch on this. I love whenever the Andorians are involved in Enterprise, bad joke my antennas perk up i i love the andorians in this show the actor that plays the lead andorian i'm blanking on his name right now jeffrey combs yeah. jeffrey combs he for me just lights up the show like it feels yeah. like whenever he's there the show goes from hey eh, it's a pretty good show to okay i'm in i sit down pay attention because this is going to be an electrifying episode a lot of dynamics really great interactions between him and archer so i always get really excited so it's very I wish they had leaned into this more in this series because as a fan of Star Trek, as you and I are, we're Star Trek nerds from way back, there's an aspect of fan fiction to whenever they deal with the through line that we see in today's episode where it's you're seeing the seeds of the Federation forming. This is fan fiction. It's yeah. like we grew up watching Star Trek, all the movies, all the shows, and it's like this is a part of the Star Trek history that we've never seen before. And we've always wondered what it's like because we knew the Andorians, the Vulcans, and the humans are the ones that started the Federation. And it's it's just like, I don't know, candy to a Star Trek fan. And I don't yeah. know why they didn't lean into this more often because it's just like, it's just popcorn. It's just, it yeah. just can't stop eating it. I just want more and more. Yeah, I agree. It feels like this is, we are now just past the halfway point of the second season. And I couldn't help but wonder why wasn't this a storyline that would have been in the second half of the first season. Yep. It really feels like it, there was so much. The first season spent so much time with the temporal cold war, which, which went nowhere, <laughs> which went nowhere. But ultimately not only did it go nowhere, why embed in what is effectively the biggest prequel that Trek could have envisioned the very first starship enterprise. Mm -hmm. Why try to embed time travel? And a potential future into that in that way. So much effort and energy going into that. Whereas this, this is what you tune into the show for. Like, what are the first days of pre-Federation? What does that look like? And the idea that the Federation is born in fire and blood. 
in in a in a territorial dispute where the brilliance of the opening scene where there's combat going on in this planet and you see Shran played by Jeffrey Combs say I know somebody who can help us get a ceasefire here Mm -hmm. and it's the pink skin and so you end up with that moment of when Admiral Forrest played by Vaughn Armstrong contacts Archer and Archer's response is basically I don't want to do this yeah like I don't want any part of this. This sounds like I'd be stepping into a hornet's nest. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. And the idea that this is the first time that the Vulcans have turned to the humans and said, I think we need your help. And the fact that the Andorians are reaching out and it's Shran personally, when Archer finds out that it's Shran, suddenly he gets a smirk when he has that moment where he's sitting across from the ambassadors of all played by Gary Graham. And Saval is pushing back on human involvement at all. He thinks that they're going to screw it up. Mm -hmm. But when he says this commander Shran, why would a commander of the Andorian forces be asking for you by name? And Archer at first is like, who would be asking for me? But as soon as he hears Shran, he stands up and looks at Trip and he gets a smirk. (laughs) Yeah. And he's just like, I'm going to turn the screw a little bit. And he turns to Saval and is like, it sounds like you need my help and is fully ready to walk away. And I didn't read that as a bluff. No, I it didn't come his, across as a bluff. His saying, like, you don't want my involvement? Fine. We'll go back to our mission. We're just flying around in space. Mm-hmm. Privately, he admits to some people, I think our mission is more than just wandering around in space. I think maybe we're supposed to be doing this kind of thing of getting people to talk and get past these differences. The power of Shran's opening scene inviting him in the power of the scene around the table when Saval is saying I don't want you here and Archer not only says I'll walk away but then even pushes back on the idea that Saval has any say in what's going on at all yeah Saval says my second will go with you and Archer's response is no I'm not taking any of your people with me I'll take my people which means to Paul yeah but I'm not taking any of your people because they asked for me they didn't ask for him yeah really smart writing very, very well paced tension, the ratcheting up notch by notch. And for the scenes between Shran and his second, who's played by Susie Plaxon, who everybody will remember has played Worf's partner, basically mm-hmm. the the mother of Worf's child. She does a great job in this. Yeah, she episode. does. She's great in this episode. Playing playing an Andorian who there's no mustache twirling. There's nobody in this who is like nefariously like, you know, ha ha ha, my plans are coming to fruition. Everybody's doing what they think is right. Everybody's everybody's doing what they think is right. Everybody thinks that they're the hero of the story. That's when this kind of plot where the tension between the players can work best is if everybody has solid ground to stand on. Nobody is saying I'm going out to kill the other side because I love killing. Mm -hmm. It's they all believe this is important enough for me to die for. It's not about them killing. It's about them being willing to die for it. And Susie Plaxon's character, Tara, has the has several moments with Shran where she is pushing back as his second in command. And he has to snap at her at one point. What did you think about that scene where he basically says, I respect your opinion, but that doesn't give you the right to criticize my decisions. Every, I thought, this is kind of a blanket statement across the entire episode. I thought all of the interactions between all the different players, were, this episode was extremely well written, in my opinion. So the, mm-hmm. the dialogue between the two of them and that conflict they have and how she's pushing back and how he has to snap her back and basically say, no, I'm in charge. This is an order. It's not a debate. Yeah. I thought it was really smart and it sets her up right from the beginning as obviously being an antagonist to Shran. And so by the end, when we discover not to jump ahead and give everything away, but she actually is kind of going behind his back and trying to kill Archer mm-hmm. and, and Saval. So it's like the fact that she did that is not surprising because from the very beginning, we know that she's not aligned with this. She thinks it's a mistake and that they're making a horrible mistake doing this and they have to show strength and fight back. So it's like, like you said, there's no much test trolling. She thinks she's the hero. She thinks she's doing the right thing. She's making a call that's best for her people. 
So it's 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 her motivations are so crystal clear from the very beginning. I, I loved it. I thought the dialogue and the way that went forward was good, but it wasn't like ham fisted and giving it all away or yeah. you know, like where a, a lesser writing and lesser show would probably have like done soap opera zoom ins and have heard kind of like going ha 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 and then yeah. walking out of the room. It was none of that. It was everything was played very straight, which I thought made it stronger. Yeah. You would have had in in a lesser episode. Yeah. You would have her giving knowing glances to people in the room. Yeah. You would have had clearly the passing of secret messages, giving yep. hand signals or some sort of sensor would have gone off and we would have seen raised eyebrows at one another. And in this, she pushes back on Shran. He pushes back on her. Ultimately, it feels like what has happened is that they have set up in the writing a line between the two of them. And the line between the two of them is the idea of negotiations taking place with the Balkans. Yep. Shran is looking at it and criticizing the idea that negotiations might take a long time. Yep. His thing is like the Vulcans, they just, and, and, and his performance in this is so perfect. You can just tell that Jeffrey Combs loves playing this character. Oh, Jeffrey yeah, Combs has played characters in Trek before. He plays one of my favorite characters in Deep Space Nine. But yes, but the the way he portrays Shran in this episode in particular is so perfect, pitch perfect, that he has that moment where he says, the Vulcans just will wear you down by dragging things out and talking for a hundred years. It'll just, yeah. it, it just the, the way that they will just sand away your ability to withstand any more conversation, nonstop talk. And, and her response is she doesn't want the negotiations to take place at all because the weakness she sees in the negotiations is Shran. She says, you'll negotiate, negotiate away our entire claim. And so when you have the two characters both looking at the same thing and they're seeing a different problem, but they're not hearing each other, that is really strong conflict. The, the other th- side of that is when, sh- when she's questioning also bringing in the pink skin, bringing in Archer, he, every time he talks about Archer, he almost looks envious and has almost a wistful memory of like, yeah. he's been able twice to get the Vulcans to do things that I didn't think was possible. So it's like, right. he's a little bit in awe of how he's figured out how to manipulate the Vulcans to get what he wants. Yeah, And so it's like, that's why it, it shows why he is so willing and needs Archer to come in because he, yeah. he thinks Archer can do a trifecta here and do it again. And so it's, it's, it's nice to see that budding relationship and respect that the two of them have for each other and that Shran yeah. is leaning on that. And it's his second in command doesn't have that experience with Archer. So it's a, once again, right. it's a nice dichotomy that they're setting up of like Shran knows he can rely on Archer, but she has no idea who this guy is. And it's like, what does he know? So it's a blind spot for her. So it's once again, yeah. it kind of, it's smart writing. It's smart the way they put this all together. And it's, I, I got to give my hats off to them for yeah. the execution. On she, she even expresses that she believes that Archer is nothing more than a puppet. Yeah. The Vulcans have a puppet on a string and they're they're pulling his his strings. And like you said, her, her lack of personal experience with him mm-hmm. is clearly undermining this. It's it goes back to something we talked about last week. It about being open communication and ignorance. The ignorance and the closed lines of communication are leading to this conflict. And Archer, through action, is trying to demonstrate good faith Mm -hmm. when they crash after being shot down and they have ambassador saval with them saval says the vulcan line is right over here they could get there and then be safe but archer argues and then they wander deeper into the no man's land between the two opposing forces because his entire goal is we were supposed to come and see them. It was their invitation that was bringing us here. And if mm-hmm. we don't do that, we then look like we've done something nefarious. Yep. So it's this archers without being at a table and having conversations. Everybody else has conversations. Shran and his number two have conversations. Zaval does a lot of talking with Paul pushing back and saying, there's a really nice scene where he is basically saying to her, like, you've thrown your career away. You even developed a human accent. And she says, 
just because I respect him doesn't mean that I am somehow being manipulated or lesser than. And there is that burgeoning respect from Saval by the end of the episode. And there's the ongoing respect from Shran. And while all of that is happening, it is just Archer is just action through the episode. I was going to, which I really liked. Yeah, it is. It's a nice marriage of action with the philosophical concepts. The episode is balanced well in that way. But the fact that Archer isn't sitting down at a table and speechifying, he doesn't have a moment where he says, let me tell you what it means to be human. There's yes. no there's no Kirk like monologue at the end of this that or Picard like monologue or Picard like monologue where it would have been like here let me explain to you what it means to be human. There is just a guy scrambling around in the dirt trying to survive to demonstrate. Look, I am trying to do the right thing for both of you. The best episodes, in my opinion, are the ones that do a good balance between the action and the philosophical discussions that Star Trek is really known for. At least classic Trek, modern Trek's more action based. But mm-hmm. it's, 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 you're getting character development, you're getting great like dialogue and philosophical discussions happening while there's action in and around the action. It's woven in. So you never feel like you're getting an exposition dump. You never mm-hmm. feel like you're being lectured to. The episode has enough action that it's exciting just to, from an action point of view. It's, there's a lot of tension throughout the entire episode. And it, it's a brilliant marriage of that. It reminded me a little bit of completely different plot, but like, there are four lights. It's like when he's yeah. <laughs> hung up, the tension in that episode is ratcheted up. There's a ton of philosophical discussion, but you're watching Picard get tortured the entire episode. So it's like there's this, oh my God, this, this level of tension and anxiety where this one also has action and anxiety with the, the storytelling going in throughout it. And that dialogue that you brought up between uh, T'Pol and Saval is great. It's like that scene where she basically stands up for it. I respect him. It's, it's once again, it's a little character to moment and it, it helps to build those relationships. It's literally a sentence. It's like, it's an example of how good writing can elevate what might be a pedestrian story. Yeah. If you couldn't tell, I love this episode. <laughs> yeah. This episode for me, was, it, hit, it hit all the boxes for me as well. Yeah. Including having what I thought was some very, very well rendered and dramatic B storyline, which was so Trip. intimately woven in Trip. Trip's captaincy man in the Enterprise, he where <laughs> he's basically playing the Captain Kirk role in command he looks of the Enterprise. So in that moment, the entire time where, he's doing what he's doing. Yep. He the Enterprise in orbit loses track of the shuttle in communication with the Vulcans who the Vulcan played by Gary, by John Balma, who plays Maroc and Maroc sort of snidely mentions like our senses are better than yours. So we know where they went down Mm -hmm. and leaves them in the dark. The enterprise trip says we want to be a part of the rescue operation and Maroc doesn't allow it. And trips concern is that the Vulcans, the last time that they operated with the Vulcans, with the Andorian storyline was that the Vulcans showed up and blew everything up. So he's trying to avoid a powder keg moment. He recognizes what's potentially going to happen here. Meanwhile, Andorian ships are on their way with support for the Andorians on the planet. And by the time all the pieces come together, the enterprise knows roughly where the captain is. They know he's still alive, but they can't reach him. And the Vulcans have moved their ships out of orbit in a way that's ready for combat and the Andorians show up. So Trip does the only thing he can do. He He just parks the the Enterprise right in the middle. And when he says to read, read smiles, go go to red alert (laughs) and read hits the button and you hear for the first time the red alert klaxon that they've now decided you'll remember episodes ago when reed Reed was trying to figure out what the read alert would sound like there were so many different alarms going off that it was a joke throughout the episode it wasn't the same twice but now this is the red alert goes on it is a simple bell and the red lights flashing and reed looks up at nobody and looks proud yes like we are ready for combat. And then Trip just parks the ship between the two sides, both of whom 
in a split screen conversation, which looks a little bit like a Zoom meeting, which we've all been enjoying during the pandemic. He has a two way conversation with the Vulcan commander and the Andorian commander, and both of them say you might want to get out of the way Mm -hmm. because we're going to start firing at each other. And his response is, I'm going to fire at anybody who tries to go to that planet. Mm -hmm. And he manages to hold them there long enough for the stuff on the planet to be diffused. Ultimately, what happens at the end is the assassination attempt, which is orchestrated by Tara. She tries to shoot down the shuttlecraft, and then she and a cohort try to hunt down Saval and Archer and T'Pol. And Archer is able to foil that plot by literally being the one to just you know, fist fight his way through both of them. He's able to capture Tara. And then there's a nice moment where Shran shows up and all he knows is that Archer has been fighting with Tara and Tara claims they're the ones who've done this nefarious thing. And it's a great moment with Saval standing right there where Archer is able to say, look, you know why you brought me here. Do you really think I would have gone to all this trouble and injured Saval in the way that he's been injured just to do what she's claiming I'm doing? And Shran in that moment, despite years of having worked with her, recognizes he's seen through her facade. And it's a great moment for Saval as well, where it then, the episode then ends with talks have begun. The ceasefire is in place and talks have begun and Shran is already exhausted by them. He is already (laughs) at a moment of just like, God, can we please just get past this? And he has picked up on something that Archer said at the beginning, when Archer first meets Shran on the planet, Archer jokes in these squalid conditions, I envisioned we'd be sitting around a big table with champagne. So pink Shran sense, has pink brought, skin sense of humor. I love yeah, the response. And his, his <laughs> response, pink skin sense of humor. So Shran in this moment at the end, he has brought some alcohol of some sort. He pours glasses and says, let's drink to this process. And the Vulcans include themselves in this, despite the fact the Vulcans don't drink. Clearly, Saval does not enjoy the taste. Yeah. He drinks it, makes a face, grimaces, but then on his way out the door, turns and says to Archer, you haven't basically says you haven't bumbled your way through this. Yeah. And after he leaves, Shran gives a great closing line. <laughs> My you favorite share line. The closing line. He basically says, I think he likes you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to which Archer says, don't be so sure. But all in all. A terrific episode in my yes. estimation i give this one an a this is yeah, the first this is, a, a this is the first me. enterprise this is the first episode of enterprise where i felt like clearly this is an a and this this was the promise of this show it's yeah. like we were meant to see the formation of the federation and lo and behold that's my favorite episode so far is when they actually start to deliver on that promise and, and right. i don't want to i don't want to give motivations to the, the writers and braga and those guys but it comes across to me as if they didn't know who their audience was for this show, that they mm-hmm. may have been a little burned out by Star Trek and they were yep. looking for something fun and engaging for themselves, which is why they came up with the whole temporal cold war. And they were trying to do something different and something that was probably exciting to them and yep. not leaning into what the audience actually wanted. And for me, I wanted more Kirk like adventures, the formation of the Federation, the history that I've always dreamt of from the universe. And they weren't giving it to me until yeah. now. And so it's like, it took them two and a half seasons. I mean, yeah. one and a half seasons. One and a half get, seasons. One and a half yes. seasons to get to this point. And it's like, why did it take you this many episodes to get to the point where this was the promise of the show? So it feels like there was a dissonance between what they wanted to do as creators and what the audience actually wanted. I agree. I'm curious about our listeners. Do you have any ideas as to what it might have been? Do you think it was like Matt laid out just now so nicely? Do you think that they were chasing after a brass ring of their own design without recognizing what the audience was actually interested in? And do you think that, like I said, that this is clearly an A episode or did you see this as being something else? Let us know in the comments or you can reach out to us through the contact information in the podcast description. And of course, we'll be back next week. We're going to be talking about the episode Future Tense. 
Matt, do you have any speculation about what that episode is about? Probably talking about something in the future. I think you should have said we will be talking about something in the future, but that's <laughs> just me. Yeah. Well, you're the writer. That's right. <laughs> Speaking of which, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can look for my books there, find that information. And then you can look for the books at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any non-mega bookstore, your local bookstore, or public library. Matt, how about you? What do you have coming up on your channel? About the time this episode's coming out, I probably have on my main channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, an episode on small modular reactors and micro nuclear reactors, things that you'd probably take to Mars as we colonize other planets somewhat star trek related assuming assuming we can get that far we'll yes. see yes no spoilers thank you so much to everybody for supporting the show by listening to us and don't forget you can support us even more by reviewing us on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify wherever it is that you found this episode that includes youtube and if you'd like to more directly support us you can go to trekintime.show and click the become a supporter button there that allows you to throw some coins at us and we appreciate the support no matter what kind of support it is thank you so much for listening everybody and we'll talk to you next time <laughs>